Uh, right, our last talk for today is uh, Pam Jett here. She's come from uh, an organisation uh, locally called Focus Birmingham, uh, the local visual impairment uh, charity. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about uh, benefits and uh, life during the pandemic. Good afternoon, everyone. As it we're entering um, the end of the day, um, I don't know how I'm going to live up to the other speakers. So I'm very humbled to be standing here today. As, as it was explained, I do work for a, a brilliant organisation, um, Focus Birmingham. We are an independent sight loss charity. My kind of role is information, advice and guidance. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. I call this my holistic career and I'm actually based in the Low Vision Centre. And I have been speaking to some of you today and some of our clinicians are still there. And I have to be honest with you, this is um, the best thing I've done. But prior to this, I actually come from an arts background, so I totally diversified and worked for Focus. Now I'm going to be talking about a case study uh, which I have been helping uh, an individual. They identify as um, somebody called Hope. Now Hope was actually an individual who had an academic career and they were struggling with their failing eyesight. And they identify as they, them, so I will be addressing them as them and Hope. Hope was also a very kind of get-setter person that wanted to be, you know, there at the centre of helping everyone. But with feigning eyesight, which led on to other medical health conditions, they'd lost their academic career more or less overnight, which set them down into very deep depression, very sadness of having no financial means to support themselves and also you know being physically independent the family that they were the go-to person started to go to other people so they lost their identity as to where they fitted in the family arena hope always wanted to be that person never to be the person to be dependent on anyone else the eyesight led on to other health conditions which uh, inhibited their mobility. Sadly, um, it affected their inner relationship, so uh, a lot of people started to not help. Hope felt very isolated and then they started to stay at home. They didn't know where to turn to, what to do, and they decided to stay at home. Savings were depleting. Once having such a brilliant academic career and mind, and they couldn't recognise their face in the mirror anymore. Five cycles of why me, the anger, the grief, disappointment, and then so I started to step in. And even the arguments got, you know, bigger and bigger and more inflated. So they didn't know what to do. Money was depleting. And then they thought, well, where do I go? What do I do? After, you know, earning such a substantial amount uh, of salary every month, they were left with the bare bones to live on. Poverty was striking and they had to resort to going on to benefits, but didn't know where to go, so they came to us. Hope then sought sanctuary from us and they needed help. I mean, you can all agree with me here, folks. Navigating the benefit system is very, very difficult. You need to have an encyclopedia to even understand the basic jargon. So there were various means that they had to go through, uh, like work capability with DWP. Again, uh, the stereotype that everyone on benefits fit, uh, you know, a negative stereotype, Hope wanted to break. They felt that they were not that stereotype as it's portrayed in the media and everywhere else that we hear and see and read. So they came to us for support and were broken, actually. They needed counselling, they were depressed, they needed help, and they didn't know who to turn to, so they came to us. And fortunate for them, they came to a service which has a very, very high esteem for looking at a person-centred approach and making lives better, which is, you know, two of our core values. The actual individual themselves, Hope, thought, well, what do I do? And the shame they felt in applying for benefits was overbearing. So they didn't understand what ESA meant. They didn't understand the different tiers of the benefit system. They didn't even understand why you had means-tested and non-means-tested benefits because they didn't know which way to turn. So they went through the work capability. 
proving that the fact that they needed support and felt humiliated when they had the, um, you know, the assessment. And bearing in mind this person has a, you know, creative academic mind. And after that, they wanted to apply for what they called PIP. Again, understanding the benefit system, thinking, well, hang on a minute. Why do I have to go through it again? I've just done the work capability, but that was for assessment for work, not for your disability. And the question that they asked is when they were granted ESA, why cannot the PIP and the ESA be joined? Why do you have to go through it time and time again and to be humiliated and to be, you know, felt small? Hope pursued, carried on, and even the questions were quite, you know, repetitive. And the evidence that they had to provide with medical and other assessments I went through. Now, when they were starting to get more or less back into a financial stability, COVID hit. And we've all been through it, folks. Um, hope being on their own felt more isolated. They were just starting to regain a bit of their confidence and a bit of, you know, self-esteem. And those two, three years that they were isolated, they were able to kind of, you know, engage in the activities that we have at Focus. Some of them were online. So, I mean, how many of us kept saying, you know, how to use Teams and Zoom? You're on mute. How many times we've all heard that? So, but hope didn't lose hope and they carried on and pursued. But having said that, at the end of the day, they still weren't awarded their PIP and they were living on. And this is a question for the audience, for all of you. What essentials would you cut out and could you survive on £450 a month? Because that's what hope was granted under the ESA, which is a contribution based. And they couldn't understand that how they got to this because they had, you know, thousands and their savings had depleted pretty quickly. They started to rely on, um, in COVID, on their neighbours because they were facing financial poverty, not only with their utilities, but also internet poverty. And how many of us were, you know, we couldn't social distance. We got forgotten as a community. The visual impairment community got forgotten. So we had to fight. I mean, what was the thing about toilet rolls? I, I don't get that. You know, in COVID. But the question is, folks, and I will revisit that question. Could you survive £450 a month? What would you cut out which would you class as essential? That is the question that Hope is throwing to you. Hope carried on and Hope thought, hang on a minute, I can't keep carrying on like this. We were coming out of COVID and Hope was actually struggling with long COVID symptoms as well as everything else that was going on. So trying to rehabilitate, trying to kind of get back onto the straight and narrow was very difficult. Depression was still there. And until they can actually admit to themselves they needed help, they reached out and hope now, um, fast forwarding a few months into like the last few years, hope wanted to give something back. And they kept saying, I used to do this, I used to do that. And we were saying, well, how many times when you're given a diagnosis, folks, you have the clinical pathway, they forget the emotional and the holistic pathway. So the two do marry and hope, you know, was wondering, well, I don't know what to do anymore. Where do I go? And when they were given a cane, that was the next step for rehabilitation. Because when COVID did hit, every services that was available to us had stopped. Nobody was actually engaging face to face anymore. So suffering with long COVID system, financial poverty, and also turning to their friends and family for support. Um, it's like going cap in hand, um, but hope never gave up. Hope wanted to give something back and wanted to actually help the organisation that helped them. So they seeked to actually do volunteering, looked at various volunteering roles who they are now affiliated with various charities. They did actually get their PIP at both enhanced rates and they are no longer on the ESA benefit. They are now in a career and they are given something back. So my question to you before I conclude, folks, because I am mindful of time, what would you cut out? So could I just have maybe one or two answers just thrown to me? What would you cut out with £450? What would you cut out? Would it be food? Would it be the internet? 
What would it be? Close? It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. That's what I hope they've done. And cereal was the best friend, which isn't very nice, actually. It depends what you eat. But Hope now is actually in, in full-time employment, and it just shows that with organisations like Focus and other organisations that are around, counselling was the first step that was taken, but you have to walk with them. Tools can be given to people, but it depends on how you embrace it. And my personal story, folks, the role I do is crucial to the story of Hope, because we don't want to lose hope in times of COVID, post-COVID, in times of a cost of living crisis, the benefits uh, are very difficult to navigate, especially when you've worked in such a, a great career. And um, there's many hopes around in this room, as I'm sure you'll agree with me. So, like I was saying, please don't give up hope. Hope is real. Hope is in a successful career with a little smile on their face and um, they are embracing their disability, which has given them empowerment, enjoyment. Everyone has their bad days, who doesn't? But they've not looked back, and they've gone from success to success. And without charities like Focus and other charities like the RNIB and yourselves, and the amount of importance on research, let's hope we can have a cure for all visual impairment and all diseases. Because people concentrate on when you have a disability of what you can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's concentrate on what we can do, folks. Let's enable everyone to have that hope and not lose it. Thank you. I have missed a lot out, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> you know what they say about remembering? <laughs> But does anyone, um, just yeah, a couple any of questions, yeah. any questions about the £450 budget? It's hard, isn't it? Do, do, do you think it's better that a local charity, you know, you, you're a small local charity really, aren't you? Yes, we are. And do you find you're more nimble and able to help? Um, since I've been doing this role, mm. I have seen the progress, just similar to Hope's case, has made. Some people haven't had PIP, they've had it denied three times. And with, with kind of gentle, gentle kind of, you know, filling in the forms, people say to me, well, how do you do it? But even though we are small, we are, we are quite big. We've been established since the late 1800s. Name has changed over the years, but it's not just about people with dual sensory loss, because we we're very unique, we have a low vision clinic. So we have optometrists on site and also low vision dispensing optician as well. We have a shop affiliated to where we are. And also we have information, advice and guidance. I also have a colleague who actually delivers kitchen skills um, and being safe in the kitchen for daily living for people who are transitioning over from being VI. And also um, they do tech, because technology is so important, folks. I mean, if we didn't have our technology, some people are actually facing hardship, so some of the actual benefits do not... They, they are kind of disadvantaged for people who are on a contribution-based style ESA, because not all the means-tested benefits. So it's, 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 you know, I could be here all night, which I don't want to be, because, <laughs> you know, we're all, um, you know, kind of engaging for the, for the right reasons. But even though we are a small charity, we provide a lot of support, not just for the individual, but for families as well. You know, because it affects the families and people forget that. Um, and I'm actually one of a similar c a case to Hope because I wanted to give something back. And when Hope was always saying, Well, I can't do this, I was an academic, they still are an academic. They haven't lost that brain power. They haven't. And that's what the, the belief that they've lost. So uh, f for, for any organisation, big or small, we all fit in the cog. And we do do signposting as well to other charities and RNIB and also Birmingham City Council and also working closely with the ECLOs. Our referrals come far and wide, but within the Birmingham quadrant, uh, which is one of the criterias. Um, I actually am a trustee for another charity and I've seen how much work a small charity does actually do, the impact it makes on people who are either on their own or the family or they're struggling. All they do is reach out and we can support them as best we can. 
And we do have realistic outcomes as well. Okay. Any other questions, folks? No? Thank you for listening. <laughs> I've had a you. Thank you.